Well, good to see everyone. My name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here. And if I sound a little bit different, I'm not doing FM radio at night. I have a little bit of an allergy situation going on. So my voice is a little weak. I want to apologize ahead of time. And so I know we don't sound this smooth. 105.6 Cornerstone Radio. Anyhow, this is what I sound like today. But hey, listen, everybody, we just saw the Memorial Day video, and I just want to encourage you as we have barbecues and do what we do, we don't recognize that 1.2 million people, estimates, gave their lives since 1776. Over 700,000 people died during the Civil War. That's the bloodiest war we ever had. And then World War II... World War I, 58,000 for Vietnam. And so we have to remember, and even the recent things, we want to thank God because if it wasn't for these brave men and women, you and I would not be here today. And freedom is not free. It costs blood. The best example of that, of course, is Jesus Christ. He spilled his blood for our freedom. So can we remember today? Let's take a moment of silence Lord Jesus, I want to thank you. Well, we want to thank you, God, for allowing us to live in the United States of America, an incredible country where we have freedom to gather here. We have freedom to spread the gospel around the world. We have freedom to live in this great nation. We thank you for the men and women that lay down their lives for us. Father, I pray that we would never take lightly the sacrifice and that we would honor their blood by honoring you and making sure what makes, what makes us a great country is a great people, and it's your church. So, Lord, we ask that we would be salt and that we would be light and that we would honor the legacy of the freedom that we have today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, right after World War II and when we were fighting, communism came after, they decided after... Uh, that to put in God we trust on the currency, paper currency of our, of, our, of our money. It was on the coins in God we trust. And so sometimes it takes difficult times. Hey, it's so good to see everyone, everybody. And one more time, my name is Eric Bucci, lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. And if this is your first time joining with us today, I personally want to say thank you so much for being here today. If you're watching online, if you're watching online right now, we want to welcome you as well and let you know that you matter as well. And we really want to encourage you. Uh, to, to participate today. And so thank you. Can you guys do me a big favor? Can you welcome everyone that's watching in line, everyone new for the first time? Well, today also is Pentecost Sunday. There's a lot going on today. And Pentecost Sunday was the birth of the church. For 40 days, the church waited. And then after Jesus uh, rose again from the dead, and they waited in the upper room, what happened was on that morning of Pentecost, first fruits, the Holy Spirit fell on 120, gathered, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. And it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the church began powerfully at that moment, 3,000 to one day. And it began to proliferate and grow and grow. And miracles were taking place. And we believe that same miracle-working power of the Holy Spirit is with us today. We also believe that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to encourage you with that. If anyone wants prayer afterwards or service, we have a prayer team there for you. But today I want to talk about killing hostility. I don't know if you've noticed how much hostility we have in our land today. There's a lot of hostility. You know, I, I don't think uh, I've heard commentators and, and historians say we haven't had this much conflict probably since 1968 or so. Perhaps it's even, it's getting bad in our country where we, we don't seem to have a common ground. At least in the past, there was some kind of common ground. But in the political realm, we've never been at this place where we, except for the Civil War, where we're at each other's throats, right? If someone disagrees with you, they're your enemy. Unfortunately, I, I wish I said it wasn't true, but it is. The church in many ways has kind of mirrored society. And we have become very segregated. 
Martin Luther King Jr. said the most segregated hour in America is 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings where you have um, different African Americans or not with. I'm thankful that our church, that we have a multicultural. But many times people strata and go in their own little place. I know my son Luke just got back from Finland and uh, visit our brother-in-law and, uh, and got a chance to go to the U.S. Embassy there. He says, Dad, as much as I like Finland, they were all white people. There was no, there was no, there was no diversity. I mean, I'm not just saying that to, to, as a political buzzword, but there's something beautiful about when God has a mosaic of different people. When you begin to understand that and the gifts that each person gives, and I'm not, I'm not awoke, I'm awakened by the Holy Spirit. There's a vast difference between that. And so we need to lead the way in this, that every single person is made in the image of God and has intrinsic value, every person. And so what we want to be doing is killing hostility, which sounds like a very, almost like an oxymoron. How are you supposed to be killing hostility? Well, I didn't make it up. It's in the Bible. Christ came, and he's killing hostility, and you and I should be killing hostility wherever we go because we're not fighting against spiritual forces only, physical, but we're fighting spiritual forces. How can we do that? We as a church should lead the way. Jesus says, this is how men will know you're my disciples, how you love each other. A new commandment I give to you, love each other as I've loved you, that the world would know. The world sees all this chaos, and they need to know there's a place and a people who are unified in Christ Jesus. Now, we don't just unify for unified sake. We unify under the banner, under the purpose of Jesus Christ. And we follow the 66 books of the Bible. It is our guide. It is the love letter God has given us. It's how we live our lives. So today we're talking about killing hostility in the book of Ephesians. Just to kind of remember everybody, Ephesians was a, a, a metropolitan city in the day of Paul. About 150 to 200,000 people lived in that city. The apostle Paul spent the most of his time, uh, probably the longest stay he had was about two and a half to three years in that city. Established churches, um, taught nearly every day. And then now as he's writing this, he's imprisoned. And he's writing to the geographical location of the people of Ephesus, okay? And so we've been talking about what it means to be in Christ. Now, the whole purpose of our series is in this, from identity to destiny. Ephesians talks about what we are. I just want to just quickly, quickly um, talk about what we used to be and what we are now. What last week we mentioned about John Newton, and that is the person who wrote the great hymn, Amazing Grace, not the one that discovered Fig Newtons, okay? And this is what he said, and this is back in the 1700s. This is what he said. I can't remember. He was a slave trader. He was a racist. He was a horrible man, but he read the imitation. He read a book that touched him. He went, he gave his life to Christ, became an Anglican pastor, as we spoke about last week. And this is what he said. He was getting old and advancing years. He's ready to die, and his health was failing. His mental capacities and fa faculties were not as sharp as he was. And this is one of the last quotes we have from him. This is what he said. I can't remember much, but I do remember this. I was a terrible sinner. I was a terrible center, um, sinner, and God is a wonderful Savior. I was a terrible sinner, and God is a wonderful Savior. When we understand that, we have a good idea of what we are before God that helps us. And we've been talking about understanding who we are in Christ and who we are without Christ is essentially important. The two most important thoughts we can have, we talked about this, is this. What do I think about God? And what do I think about myself? These two thinking establishes everything you and I do how we think about God, and how we think about each other. It's, it's essential that we get these right because our identity leads us to our destiny. What you think about yourself 
and what you think about God is extremely important. Remember, everybody, we've been talking about this as well. In our culture, people often say, I do, therefore I am. It's all about the exterior. Change the exterior and your internal identity will change. No. You can change your exterior all you want. What really needs to change is your interior. And therefore, these I do, therefore I am is important. But this is the way it should be. I am, therefore I do. And that's the proper sequence. I am a child of God, therefore I do. And that's why it's so important. Rather than focus on behavior, when someone gives their life to Jesus Christ, and I'm so thankful God's patient with me, we don't give them a huge book. Now follow these. Instead, what happens? Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I submit to him, right? I submit to him. I'm a child of God. And when I know who I am in Christ, my behavior should begin to change. So our objective is to help people come to know Jesus and to surrender their lives to him and make him a Lord of their lives where they're not the boss anymore, but he is. He's God and they're not. That's when lives begin to change. So chasing behavior is secondary. Most important thing we can do is the lordship of Jesus Christ. We talked about this. Identity. We cannot find who we are without knowing who God is because God is the author and he's the completer of our faith. If we want to change our destiny, we must change what we think about God and we think about ourselves. And Ephesians does a masterful job in the first three chapters, it tells us who we are. We've been going through it, knowing our identity, knowing who we are, that we could stand with great confidence, knowing that we're citizens of heaven. Extremely important. In Romans 12, 2, we talked about this. And do not be conformed to the pattern of this robot, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We mentioned that last week. We want to renew our mind. And Ephesians does an amazing job. In fact, I want to encourage you to go back and read chapter 1. And the, the prayer that the, the Apostle Paul prays for the church, pray over yourself. Know who you are in Christ Jesus. So we're killing hostility when we remember we are products of grace. We didn't deserve it, but God gave us grace. Unmerited favor. You did not earn it. And I want to quote to you um, Tim Keller, a wonderful man of God who just went home with the Lord after his battle with pancreatic cancer. Tremendous man of God. And this is what he said. I think it, it, it sums up the gospel. This is what he says. You're more wicked than you ever believed, but at the same time, more loved and accepted than you ever dared to hope. That is the gospel. When we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, it is by grace you've been saved, not by works, lest anyone can boast. When you realize you have no capacity to save yourself, there's nothing you can do to save yourself except surrender to Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can do it. And so in Ephesians 2.10, one of the major components of this whole series comes from what we spoke about last week. We're going to go to verse 11. But before verse 11 comes verse 10. For we are his workmanship. We are his poem. We are his design created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Good works don't create us, but we're created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. So God has a purpose. He has a plan. He has a mission. The reason why you are living in 2023, if you're a shut-in and not home and cannot get out of the house, God has you here for a reason. Could it be intercession? Could it be encouragement? And the enemy would say, you're washed up. There's nothing more you can do. I'm going to look at her here in the camera and saying, God has you here for a purpose. All of us are here for a purpose. We want to embrace God's purpose for our life. We don't want to try to be somebody else, but we want to be the divine version that God has for you. You are an instrument. And so God is the player. He blows through you by his spirit. The spirit of God blows through you and your design will let out a musical note. And we are an orchestra playing under the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God the Father. We are an orchestra all doing our job. And maybe you feel like you're nothing but a triangle. I remember going uh, to an orchestra, and I actually played in orchestras, and this poor person, all they had to do the whole, the whole time was play a triangle. And they wait for an hour and a half, and finally, for like two measures, they go, dee, 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 and that's all they did. 
but it brought something to the orchestra. We don't care who gets the credit except for Jesus Christ. It's amazing what we can accomplish. And God is calling us to be different than the world, not competing against each other, but completing each other, helping each other, that when you win, we all win. That's how the world is looking for a community like that. Not a community that is jockeying for position. I want to be the deacon in the church. I want to be in the stage and I want to sing. God's called me to preach and all this other stuff. And we forget the, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the servant, right? And so here at Cornerstone, I pray. And if I ever get too haughty, I have a wife that puts me in my place. Praise God. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in it. Now we go to verse 11. We're going to break this down. Therefore, since, what? You're working, creating Christ Jesus? Therefore, as a result of everything I told you, remember. Have you noticed how bad our memory is? I'm not just talking about losing your keys. I'm not talking about that. And by the way, if you have trouble losing your keys, get a tile or an apple tag. It's fantastic. It saved me so many arguments. I'm the one that, honey, where is it? Ask your phone. Therefore, remember, we tend to forget. Remember that one time, you Gentiles. I, I think the majority of us here today are Gentiles. What are Gentiles? Non-Jewish people. You Gentiles in the flesh were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by the hands. Now, what is this all about? Don't worry, I'm not going to give you any illustrations about circumcision. But let me tell you what it is and what it's not. To be called a Gentile, you have to understand, everybody. You need to understand what we're talking about. We're talking about a division that was incredible. L let me give you some context for this, because I don't think we understand the divisions that were going on in the church at the time the Apostle Paul wrote this. I would venture to tell you there was a lot more division in the church then than there is now. You think it's bad right now between Republican Christians and Democrat Christians and independent Christians and vax Christians and non-vax Christians, and I'm masked and I'm masked and all the other nonsense, all that stuff that we fight over, it's so silly, right? Well, I have good news for you. It was worse then. In fact, it was horrible. L l let me explain to you. From the very beginning of, the, of, of Abraham, God said, I will make you, I will bless you. I will make you a blessing. I will make you a great nation. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And by you, the whole world will be blessed. It's always been God's design and desire that the whole world be saved. And so Jesus came. But Jesus did the first things first. He had a small group of 12 people. He had 70, he had 120, he had 500. Then he worked on, on the Israelites. And then from there, we, we branch off. You see, and so what happened was there's something called Gentiles. For the first 10 years of the church, the church was completely Jewish. Okay, I don't know if you realize that. Yeah, we're, 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 we're grafted into the Jewish nation. Christianity was not like a white man's religion. It was a Jewish sect of Judaism. And so Christians used to be called the way. Okay, and so the first 10 years of the New Testament uh, after Christ rose again from the dead and he sent his church out, for the first 10 years, it was exclusively to Jewish people. Now, it went to Samaria, which were the half-breeds, half but they still followed the law of Moses. But those outside were not that way. Let, let me give you a little bit of illustration of how Jewish people grew up. Josephus, who was a historian in the time of Christ, said this about Gentiles. Gentiles were kindling wood for hell. That's the dirty Gentile. That's right. You guys, we were just kindling wood for hell. Now, the Bible didn't say that, but that was the culture of the Jewish people in that way. They were considered disgusting. In fact, if, if it was a midwife that was Jewish, she would not help a, a non-Jewish person deliver a baby, lest another Gentile scum would come into the world. And for those of you that live in the Star Wars universe, it would be like a rebel scum. Okay, there's about three of you here today, and the rest of you are like, what is he talking about? I'm a science fiction nerd. Get over it. 
So they were really filthy and dirty. You would not even eat off the same plate as they did. They were not considered part of it. They had great separation. They could not go into the temple. Except, we'll get into that in a few moments, except for the court of the Gentiles, which I'll show you in a few moments. It was a wreck if you were a Gentile. Now, sometimes you could follow the Jewish faith. And what about the Ethiopian eunuch? Yeah, the Ethiopian eunuch actually went to Jerusalem, and God did save him but he was on the outside. But by and large, the church was primarily Jewish for its first 10 years. And so I want to give you some context. In Acts chapter 10, you don't have to look it up. You can read it later on. Acts chapter 10, uh, Peter was one of the leaders of, of the church. Well, God visited this, this centurion, this, this uh, Cornelius. Cornelius was a was a uh, Gentile, but he was a follower. He gave money to the poor. He believed. He really liked Judaism. He followed it the best he could, and he's trying to get right with God, and an angel comes to him and says, I want you to go to Joppa to Simon the Tanner. Now, Simon the Tanner is not someone who gives politicians a fake tan. Simon the Tanner, Simon the Tanner tan leather skins. So he was at Joppa, a seaport. And so what happened, isn't it amazing? Why couldn't the angel tell Cornelius, Jesus is the way, truth, and life, follow him? Because God uses us to spread the gospel. There's a, there is a correlation. There is a partnership that God delegates to us. And sometimes he has to take matters in his own hands. But my friends, you and I are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. If you don't think that's true, l- l- let me give you an example of this. When Paul, if you're not familiar, before Paul was Paul, he was called Saul. God changed his name. He was a terrorist. And he tried to gather the early Christians, and he watched them to be persecuted and even some of them killed. When when Saul was on his road to Damascus to round up these rebel Christians, he had an encounter with Jesus. And this is what Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, now I want you to follow along with this. Was Paul persecuting Jesus directly? No. Who is he persecuting? The church. Who is Jesus' hands and feet right now? The church. Why is it in 1 Corinthians? It talks about communion. Rightly dividing the body lest you drink judgment upon yourself. My friends, how we treat each other is very important. You are Jesus. You're a part of Jesus. And I need to treat you with great respect. So that alone brings you to a new place. So therefore remember that you Gentiles in the flesh were called the uncircumcision. Now circumcision was was a sign. I don't need to get into it, do I please? Thank you, okay. Um, And so circumcision was a sign of an inward commitment to Christ for the men, okay? But what happened was this. Cornelius had a vision, and he sent someone to get Peter. Peter, on his normal day of prayer, he was going up to prayer, pray on the rooftop. And by the way, let me encourage you with this. God will often give you direction when you have routines and rhythms of, of spending time with God. So he was spending time with the Lord, and he had a vision. In the vision, a great white sheet came down, and all these dirty animals, unclean animals, which were considered sacrilegious to eat, um, the Bible, uh, the voice said, kill and eat. And he said, I will never do that. I will never do that. And God says, never call. He goes, don't call what I call clean, unclean. And after that, there was a knock on the door. And Peter put two and two together. Ha, ha. So they began to, he went to Cornelius' house. He talked about Jesus Christ. As he was doing that, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They began to speak with tongues. They're like, well, I guess they're Christians after all, so we can't help but accept them. And something dramatic happened at that day. It took all the way to Acts chapter 15, where finally the Jerusalem Council got together and said, we have to let them in. They don't need to do all the ceremonial laws. They don't need to, to you know, do all those things. All they need to do is not eat meat sacrificed to idols and refrain from sexual um, promiscuity and be, you know, be pure in that way with their husbands and wives and follow Christ. And so they made it very simple to join in. However, there was still, you know, those people. 
When I went to Romania on a mission trip, uh, we had the church there. They had these gypsy Christians. You don't know what gypsies are too much in America. We don't have them here too much. But, you know, in Europe, like, oh, gypsies. Oof. They're really, you know, they're not really liked. And so when a gypsy would come to the church, it's like, oh, gosh, a gypsy. And it was hard for the Romanian church to allow these gypsies to come in because they had a bad reputation. They were considered less than. And that's kind of how the Jewish people saw non-Jewish people. So it was a great battle you can see throughout Paul's writings. So I just want to bring you context here so you understand what we're talking about. This is a major shift. This from kindling wood from hell, now they're your brother and your sister. So you think there's great racial divide in America? There ain't nothing compared to this. This brings us to a whole nother level. So who should be the one that sets the standard for unity? is the church of Jesus Christ. That every person is made in the image of God. Every person is part of the body of Christ. So therefore, we have no right to ever show any kind of racism towards anybody. Because I'm not a white Christian. I'm a Christian that's white. I think I'm actually more like pink, (laughs) to be honest with you. Don't worry. Therefore, remember that one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. We were separated from Christ. You were aliens. Okay, you were aliens. You were like little green men, okay? Separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth. Commonwealth is not something we normally use. Commonwealth is a political term or geographical term where we are a political, a geographical body that work together, that the commonwealth of Virginia, for example, okay? The commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, that you were strangers. So he's writing primarily to a Gentile audience here because Ephesus was full of Gentiles, full of that kindling wood of hell, okay? Covenant of promise, having no hope. I can't think of anything worse in life is to be hopeless. But you have no hope. No matter how bad things get, I tell people all the time, the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus, because the best is yet to come. We are only passing through. We are eternal beings in a temporary physical body, and one day we'll be transformed. So that is the hope of Christ gives us the power. We know that he beat the power of sin and death, so we have hope. We have hope. So having no hope without God in the world, But now, I love the buts in the Bible. They're fantastic. But now, last time it was but God. But now, in what? Christ Jesus. Not your good works, not being a good person, not from growing up on a good side of town, not for having an Ivy League education. Whether you have a PhD or barely have your GED, you are accepted in Jesus Christ. That's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the Apostle Paul is speaking here, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by what? The blood of Christ. Christ is that sacrifice. It is, you ever hear someone say, well, he's not really blood. He's not a blood relative. It's my sister-in-law, but there's no blood. Well, listen, you can, sometimes you feel a little different when someone's in your blood. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, we're blood relatives. Don't mess with my family. Okay. But now, in Christ Jesus, you once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus for what? He himself, that's Jesus, is our peace. All the violence, all the destruction. Why are we engaging in things we have no business in? We should be at peace with each other. There's a lot more we could say about this to how do we have unity, and today I'm not able to do too much except for the fact that this. We need to focus on the very absolutes of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus rose again from the dead. Man is inherently a sinner gone his way to hell. Christ saved us. The 66 books of the Bible is the word of God. If we believe in those things, that's a lot. 
As far as should we wear robes, should we have a stained glass or no glass or whatever, what kind of music, that's, oh, that means nothing. But the most important thing is that. We celebrate our differences, but, but you're part of the same line. Maybe you were a trombone section in the orchestra. Maybe someone's woodwinds. Are we going to criticize the woodwinds for not being brass? No. We need to celebrate the diversity that God has given us. As long as we're dedicated to the music in front of us, which is the Bible, and we're listening to the conductor of the Holy Spirit, we should be one body, one, one people. What makes an orchestra beautiful is the diversity of the instruments. It's those that play loudly and those that play very softly. The oboe and the hobo. <laughs> For he himself is our peace. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one. See, this is what happened. This is the people you had. You had, you had the Gentiles. And then you had the Jews, two people in the world. You were either Jewish or you were scum. Now there's three. There are Gentiles, Jewish people, and a new called the church. And that's the one that's saved, okay? For he himself is our peace who made us both one. Basically, it's like having children. Our children, Matthew, Luke, and Hannah, are, come from both of us. And so you and I, when we give our life to Christ, we become part of the family of God, okay? He made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now, what's the dividing wall? What is that all about? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because uh, let me explain to you, uh, there was uh, the first temple was Solomon, then uh, they went into captivity, the Jewish people, and then they let them go back in 516. But then in about 9 BC, Herod rebuilt the temple magnificently. It was a big project, and it was incredible how it was built. This is the place where the priests would go and they had the sacrifices. They had the court of the Gentiles. They were not allowed to go in here. They were not allowed, but they could worship in the colonnades. And sometimes, this is where Jesus went, by the way. And this is where he cleared the temple because they were, instead of letting the Gentiles hear about God, they were selling stuff to make money. And Jesus went ballistic on that. And I, every time I lose my temper, I quote that scripture. I'm just turning over the tables. So he turned over the tables, and that's where it began to happen there. Let me show you a little bit more about the temple. In the temple, if you can follow along with me, I don't know if you can switch it to the other thing. There we go. You had the women's court in here. This is where the women, the men were over here. And the Gentiles were out here. You'd go about uh, 15 feet down, and there'd be a fence here about four feet deep. Okay, so you had, you had the, the priests, you had the men's area, you had the women's area, and if you were Jewish, you could go in this area. And then outside, this is the temple area, there was a fence about four feet high. All right, and on that fence, there was a sign. This is an archaeological, they actually found this. This is what they found in archaeological digs. And this, you know what this said? I know you can read that, because you guys are the first, you're the first service is real smart. That's why they get up early. I'm just joking, okay? This is what it says. No foreigner may enter within the bar barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Okay, beware of dog. Eh, that's nothing compared to this. In other words, you cross over and you get killed, it's on your hands. So you had this situation where you had this, this separation here. This is what the Apostle Paul talking about. God wipes it down. He breaks the wall of separation. He breaks all the walls of separation. I don't know if you remember, uh, Ronald Reagan in June 12, 1987, there used to be, uh, um, Germany was East and West Germany, and they had the Berlin Wall, which was a communist occupation. They would not let them out of Germany. They had to wall them in, not wall them out, wall them in, because they wanted to leave communism. It, it doesn't, by the way, it doesn't work. Okay, it was horrible. And so um, what happened was Ronald Reagan went to that very place and says, Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall. It was an iconic statement. And what happened was this. 
couple years later, 1989, November, they broke, Gorbachev actually listened, and they broke down the wall, and the wall of separation in Germany, the wall between people that knew each other, it was broken down, they became one people again. The Berlin Wall fell, it was erected in 1961, and November 9th, 1989, it's changed, and everything changed. That broken wall happened, they were unified. What happened was Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, what happened was he broke down that separation wall. Now we're all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus. That's an amazing thing, everybody. I don't think you understand the significance of that. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There should be no hostility in the church because Jesus broke down the wall of ethnicity, of difficulties. We should appreciate, we should love, we should respect different ways of worship, we should respect different races, different ways of doing things. People in Nigeria are no better or worse than me. A pygmy tribe that's worshiping God is no better or worse than me. You see, as I mentioned before, whether you have a GED or a PhD, we're the same value to God. And so this is our importance. They've broken down his flesh, dividing the wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments. So basically what that simply means is they didn't have to follow all the ceremonial law. They didn't, have to cut the, they didn't have to cut the lamb in a certain way and, and drain the blood and all that kind of stuff. You follow me, everybody? That's ceremonial law, not moral law. Expressing the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man. That's right. One man, a man. He created one new man. We're one entity in Christ Jesus. There's no more separation. We are one. My family, my children are of me. Right? My wife, we're one family. We're different personalities. Boy, they're a lot different than each other. But we're still the same family and they have the same rights and values that we have as a family. They're accepted. They're boot cheese. Praise the Lord. Can I hear an amen? Okay. Okay, so one new man in place of the two. So making peace, and he might reconcile us both to God in one body. We are the body of Christ through the cross. Therefore, killing the hostility. We should have a t-shirt, killing the hostility. That sounds so violent. You know, we have to get violent with the ideologies in our mind that are not from Christ. The Bible says, take every thought captive. And it's a violent word in 1 Corinthians. Take it captive is to take it by its scruff of its neck. I'm not gonna listen to that thought. It's a body slam, it's a slaying. Therefore, killing the hostility, and he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We are killing hostility when we remember we are products of grace and we are all one body in Christ. Anyone says, I love Jesus, but I hate his body. That's like me. It's like a husband telling his wife, honey, I love you, but I hate your body. How good is it going to go for you? Don't try it. And if the woman tells it to the man, I don't care. <laughs> We're all one body in Christ. Now listen to this as we conclude. There is neither Jew nor Greek. You see that? There is neither slave or free. There is neither male or female. Now this is not a proof text for transgenderism. What it's talking about here is the value before God. It's not talking about the differences that make us beautiful. It's not talking about the mosaic of male and female. It's not talking about the mosaic of different ethnicities and different races and different regions of the world. No, but we're all one body in Christ. You see, there is neither slave nor free. There's no male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are of Abraham's offspring, heirs to the promise. That means all the promises of Abraham are ours in Christ Jesus. We are the head and not the tail. When you read the Abrahamic covenant, I will make your name great. I will bless you. 
I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you, and you will be a blessing to everyone in the world. That's our job description. So you are blessed. You are highly favored, not because of yourself, because Jesus Christ, you are one. You're part of the lineage of Abraham. That's a big deal. Why are the Jewish people so successful? Because they understand adversity, and they fight through it. You and I have the same rights bequeathed to the Jewish people in regards to God's favor. We should be the best in all that we do. We should stay together and we should make a difference in the world. Can I hear an amen? amen? So this is all we are in Christ Jesus. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Next week we're going to talk about what that looks like, how we are the temple how we are the cornerstone. Hence, that's where we get the name of our church. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I want to thank you so much that we're here today. Lord, I pray for anyone that's here who doesn't know you, has not given their lives to you, Father. I pray that they would understand that you have died for them and that you love them. Father, we want to thank you that no one in this room, no one watching online, those who have given their lives to you and those that have not, None of us can save ourselves. We're all hopeless without you. But by grace, we've been saved through faith, not of ourselves, lest anyone can boast. And so, Jesus, I pray right now that you would just touch every person that's here. First of all, Lord, I pray if there's any racism, elitism, our way of churches, cornerstones, the better church, all this nonsense that we like to, the enemy likes to feed us. Our allegiance is to you, Jesus, and we appreciate our local body, and we are committed to each other in this local body. But we're under no illusions that we're better than any other church. You are the author and the completer of our faith. And so, Lord, I pray there would be a humility upon this church, a humility and a boldness that we would recognize that every person has intrinsic value. Every person can make a difference from a four-year-old to a 94-year-old to a 104-year-old to someone that's bound in their home and someone that's traveling around the world. We're all of your body. And so, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that this will continue to be a growing community that loves each other, Lord, a place where people come in and they see the unity. They see the diversity and the unity, the beautiful mosaic of your kingdom. And so, Lord, we pray for that. Lord, just every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you absolutely know you'd go to heaven? And if you're, if you're saying to yourself, well, I'm a pretty good person compared to everyone else. In fact, I'm better than some Christians. I act better than a lot of Christians do, therefore I'm okay. That doesn't save you, everybody. There's only one way we can be saved. It's through giving our lives to Jesus Christ. It's from you stepping down from being God and letting him be God. If you haven't done that, you're not a believer. You're not a follower of Christ. You, you just like Christianity. You like Christian philosophy. There's only one way a man and woman can be saved. It's by believing that Jesus is the Son of God and rose again from the dead. And you have to be willing to step down from being in charge and say, God, I'm not in charge. You are. If you've never done that, today's the day. Maybe you used to walk with Christ. You're not walking anymore. Maybe you've never done it. I want to know how to pray for you, and I want to, it helps you to make that commitment. I'm going to say a prayer in a few moments. How many of you would say this today? Raise your hand. Say, Pastor, I've never given my life to Christ. But today I want to, or I've fallen away, and I want to get right. Anyone to be honest enough? Thank you. Anyone else this morning? If you're in line, just say, that's me. Well, someone will see it. We're going to work on our online campus to make it more interactive soon. But that's you as well. I want to encourage you as well to, to tell somebody. Let's pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to stay, to follow you. I choose to step down from being the boss of my life. You are God and I'm not. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.